to take us on a journey then, because I mean, obviously, we're here to talk about about your career and and talk about the, the sort of music side of things. Where did it all begin for you, Rick? I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm I'm not talking about the normal the normal story of you know. Uh, you know, Shed 7 as such, but for you as a person, how did you get to Shed 7? What what was the story before that? Well, probably when I was about nine or ten, and I used to sing with a hairbrush in front of my mirror, uh, pretending <laughs> that I was on top of the pops. That's probably when it started. Yeah, well, I started there as well. <laughs> so when I, when, when I started big school, as you'd call it, when I was 11, uh, that's when I met Paul Banks, uh, the guitarist, and Tom Gladwin, the bass player. Um, and we all shared a love of music and the less charty kind of music, the more indie kind of things that were going on. So we were kind of in our own little bubble even back then, really, so to speak. Yeah. We were the kind of the weirdos of the school year because we liked that weird music and we had our hair done in a weird way, you know. So we just kind of grew up together. We were in school bands together. You know, we were playing in, in pubs around York when we were like 14 or 15. And we used to get told off in school for putting up posters advertising it. You know, whatever the band name was at the time, we'd, we'd, we'd go around po fly post in the school corridors saying we're playing at the Spotted Cow. And then the teacher said, come on, what are you doing advertising the fact you're playing in a pub and you're only 15? <laughs> <laughs> So we've kind of been doing it for an awful long time. I mean, Shed 7 basically, it, that was about 1990 when we kind of formed Shed 7 after we'd left school. And that was probably because we'd heard the Stone Roses' first album in 1989 and loved that so much that we kind of thought, right, if, we, if we're serious about this, we need to pull our socks up and start being more serious. So that was the kind of point where Shed 7 began in 1990. Amazing, amazing, and, and so I mean, once you're at that point, how did you get the, you know, how did you get the first record deal, Rick? I mean, because you know, there's always a story behind that. I mean, actually getting the deal is 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 always the biggest challenge for all the bands that are out there or all the musicians that are out there that they might have a good track or they might have a few good tracks, a good band or whatever, but they find this mysterious record deal just almost impossible to get, you know. Yeah, well, I think there is, obviously you've got to have the talent, but I think there's a lot of being in the right place at the right time and a lot of stars aligning, you know, there's an awful lot of luck involved as well. Um, for us, for us, the journey started, we'd done a, a demo of, uh, of about three or four of our tracks at the time. And funnily enough, I think Dolphin was one of them because Dolphin was one of the first songs we attempted to write as Shed 7. Um, and flukes happen, you know, we, we, um, we sold these demos probably at the little pub gigs that we were doing around York and somebody bought one of them who didn't live in York and took it back to where he lived. And he just happened to be friendly with this journalist um, who lived in Coventry called Simon Lawler, who heard it by mistake, I think, because he was friends with the, the lad who bought it and really liked it. So he contacted us because there was a contact number on the demo cassette uh, and said, would you be interested in me trying to help you out? So he kind of instigated that whole London music press kind of thing. And that got us a few gigs in London. And, you know, we'd travel from, down from York in a transit van with drums on our laps and uh, bomb down the M1, turn up at the Kentish Bull and Gate or whatever they were called, these kind of small pubs in London and play in front of three people and then drive home again. You know, we did an awful lot of that. So we kind of put the legwork in. It didn't yeah. put, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, my advice for any up and coming bands is just do the hard miles and, and anything could happen. So yeah. event eventually we got to the point where the word spread. I think we got into the enemy as in the top 10 unsigned bands list that they did at that time. So, you know, the name started getting out there. And then, yeah, just as, I think the actual gig that got us signed was, I think there was about six or seven people in the room and one of them just happened to be the, the A&R man for Polydor Records. And we, we acted like we were you too. You know, we didn't care that there's seven people in the room. We just came out and acted like we were playing at Wembley. <laughs> 
<laughs> amazing, amazing. I mean, that takes that takes a lot of courage and a lot of confidence as well, though. I mean, where does that come from, Rick? Because I mean, I, I had you guys, I booked you guys one time to come up and do a gig in uh, Dundee, and you know, I, I was amazed that you know, it was, you know, I think there was maybe a thousand thousand people or whatever at that particular gig and you came out and you know you just blew them away i mean there was it was just full of confidence full of i mean it was amazing i mean it just a lot of a lot of bands struggle with the small smaller crowds but you guys just came out and boom you know it was it was there yeah well i think a lot of it is living on the seat of your pants you know i love performing but I also don't want it to be bad. So I think we just automatically try and put 100% into it to make sure it's not a bad gig. I mean, the worst possible scenario is people walk out going, well, that was shit, wasn't it? You know, it's much better, <laughs> much yeah. better than people leaving shit singing along to the songs as they're leaving the venue, which is, we're very lucky that that happens quite a lot. I mean, it's funny when we, when we play in London now, it's almost become a thing where, you know, we finish. The, we always finish the gigs with Chasing Rainbows these days, and people are leaving the venue, and the, the whole lot of them are just singing it. And then they get on the tube, and they're still singing it. You know, it's great. It's a lovely, lovely thing to hear. Yeah. 